Have you ever had a moment where everything that you thought you knew and all the plans that you thought you had got shattered? And I'm not talking about like you don't know what to step next and how to adjust in your journey. You don't even know if you're on the right journey at all. These are moments of sincere doubt. And sometimes when they happen inside of the church, people are told, just have faith. Well, we're going to see how John the Baptist deals with some of these sincere doubts. That faith, that it's really the word pistis in Greek. It is an active trust based on what you do know. And when you have an active trust in somebody who's a king, what is that? That's allegiance. John the Baptist was an allegiant person. And he isn't going to have his doubts just dismissed because these are sincere. He really is struggling. And so let's look at this. And I would like to suggest to you that you're going to have doubts, but I want you to see them as an opportunity this morning. Now, many people ask hard questions when they have doubts. There's some emotional kind of doubts because there are multiple kinds of doubts. And in these emotional kinds of doubts, you hear questions like, why would God allow X, Y, or Z? Now, before those moments, it's really important to get data, right? You know, it's really good, like Joshua, to say, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. When in the moment it's happening and your emotions are in charge, it's really hard to have a rational in, um, back and forth with somebody in that spot. At that moment, you need to listen to those doubts. But all, not all doubts are emotional. I've certainly had emotional-based doubts. Very often when I encounter somebody in my office or I talk to somebody or pray with somebody, the emotional-based doubts are, you know, why did God allow so-and-so to die? You know, when we're not in the moment, we can picture and realize, well, we all have to go. And especially if they're a Christian, well, then they're better off. They're going home. Like we just lost Adeline Hollis. She's going home. She's home. It's wonderful for her. It's still sad for those left behind. But in the moment, it's kind of hard. But still, I had a a really serious emotional doubt when I thought I had everything figured out. And I thought I was going to be an apologist, right? I was going to be an apologetics-focused minister. I was going to be on the college campus. And that was it. That was the ministry I had landed in. That lasted two years. And it was really hard to come to grips with. This isn't having the kind of impact I thought it was going to have. You know, everything isn't going the way that I thought it was going to go. And I had to confess that, yeah, God called me to that ministry for a little bit, but that wasn't the end goal. God wasn't done with me. I I was confusing, in some sense, a stop along the way with the journey with the shepherd who should be my focus. And so it took some reorientation for me. And I think many of us have found that. What about divorces? Many of us have experienced that kind of thing. You have this wonderful big wedding. You have all this excitement, all this energy, and you think you're going to live happily ever after. And then what happens when that happily ever after is broken? It takes some uh, reorienting. But not all doubts are like that. Some doubts are based on data. Now, those we can kind of grapple with by sharing information back. And I think it's really important that the, the, the doubts based on information that you might hear, you need to remember that not all that you hear is true. If I'd have been thinking ahead, there's, a, there's this meme or this image that sometimes gets posted around with like Abraham Lincoln or George Washington that says, don't believe everything you read on the internet and, and, and citing them as the source. And I love that kind of thing as a reminder, you know, obviously the internet wasn't around then. So it's letting you know in the, its message itself that you can't trust everything. That's why the Bible calls us to be a Berean. But every year, around every holiday, I see an increasing amount of people ask me questions about things like, is Halloween really a pagan holiday? Based on, it looks like when written Sam Hain, but it's Samhain, and, and, or, or any of those kinds of things. And if I do anything at all, am I actually worshiping Satan? Now, we have lines for our kids. And I'll be honest with you, the holiday I'm really excited about celebrating tomorrow is Reformation Day, not Halloween. Because Reformation Day, you want to talk about, they had some doubts about what they were taught. They dug into scripture and then they changed and they pursued truth over tradition that was telling them things that weren't true. It was keeping them ignorant in many cases. I'm really thankful for the Protestant Reformation. But no, Halloween did not come from Samhain. If you know the word, Halloween actually is hollow eve. And it actually came from a festival or a time that happened on November 1st, 
where we are supposed to remember all the examples of the Christians who went before us. And so that's a good thing. And then the night before, they usually had a big dinner because they would fast the next day. And then over time, that dinner morphed. Now, certainly there are elements that have come and crept in that we don't do in my household. Things that I think celebrate things that are inappropriate or or focus on things that are inappropriate. But candy itself? Not a problem with candy. Well, hold on. I do have a problem with candy. But costumes? Not that big of a deal, right? And even an awareness or remembrance that there is spiritual warfare, that can be a good thing, right? But people will hear these questions and they'll start doubting. Right now on college campuses, one of the fastest growing religious groups is pagans. I grew up when, and it was a remake, I realized that, I grew up when there was a movie called Dragnet and it had Tom Hanks in it, and the pagans were the bad guys, and it stood for like people against goodness and normalcy. It was a joke. You know, there weren't no, there, there weren't no, my Kentucky's coming out, there, there were not modern pagans, but it's a fast-growing group, and there's this myth, and they keep spreading it, and I hear Christians hear it all the time, oh, all you Christians, you just stole all our ideas, and I have Christians come, and they've heard this, and they have real doubt. No, none of it's true. I, I can take them to the, the research material and see that, no, you know, Jesus wasn't a copy of some pagan myth, nor are these holidays some kind of copy of pagan myth. Now, some elements might have creeped in, and that's true. That's something that the Jewish people dealt with with syncretism, where they would sneak in elements of worship that was inappropriate. But this is data that is causing people to shake in their faith and have questions. And so when we encounter that, we should find out more. That's what we should do. Now, let's refresh I've done a long setup. Let's refresh of where we are in Luke chapter 7. And the words are going to be up on the screen, but please open your own copy of Scripture and even take a note in the margin if the Holy Spirit just put something on your heart. Let's start with verse 16. He had just raised someone from the dead and fear gripped them all and they began glorifying God saying, a great prophet has risen among us and God has visited his people. This report concerning him went, all, went out all over Judea and in the surrounding district. Now, Jesus' fame was growing. Now, people were talking about what we had just read about last week, and this very Jewish Messiah had even worked on behalf and commended a Gentile. In fact, he said this about the centurion. I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. And this was a new thing. John the Baptist was already on the scene. He was getting lots of followers, but now things were changing. And now Jesus was even stepping out and Gentiles were noticing Jesus. And that news, of course, it's going to come to John the Baptist. Verse 18, the disciples of John reported to him about all these things. Now, to refresh you on who, the, who John the Baptist was, he was a miracle child to Zacharias and Elizabeth. He was a Levite uh, by birth, and Zacharias was serving as a Levite, and he did so in the temple. In fact, he had, and this is another way that we see that there are different kinds of doubts, Zacharias had a dismissive doubt. No, that ain't going to happen. You know, you prove it with a miracle or something before I believe you. And he got uh, silenced until his son was born. Meanwhile, at the same time, we see Mary, she's going, now, okay, how is this going to work? Because I've not been with a man, how am I going to get pregnant? It was still doubt, it was still confusion, but it came from a place of willingness to learn more and to listen. Very different, and she got some answers and was blessed. But Zacharias and Elizabeth, they would take John out in the wilderness, they would raise him up, and his whole life he was told that he was going to be the forerunner of the Messiah, the Messiah was coming. He, inside the womb, recognized as Jesus was the Messiah because he leapt within the womb. And so there we go, another a wonderful Uh, reminder that inside the womb, genetically, those are human beings. And of course, personally, these are human beings, uh, fully human beings, distinct. And he would go out and he would live a Nazarite life his whole life. There was no wine. There was no grapes. There was no uh, lots of other things. He ate bugs and he even dressed like Elijah, because he was supposed to be the second coming of Elijah in a certain sense. And so 2 Kings 1 verse 8 tells us, you know, Elijah was wearing animal hair and a leather belt kind of tied around. Almost reminds me of of like a caveman description that we would think of. And that's what John wore in a time when people didn't wear things like that. He was unusual. He lived and breathed his role. And even when his parents passed, and we don't have that because he was a Nazarite, he was not allowed to touch their bodies. So there was no, you know, 
holding their hand right at that moment in case when they passed, he might have accidentally broken his Nazarite vow. And so this would have been a hard thing for him, and he sacrificed his whole life to do this. And he even along the way, he had to say goodbye to some of his disciples that he had uh, been training. John 1.40 says, One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And these are two that followed Jesus after they had heard uh, John recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. So he was saying goodbye. And disciples in that day and era, that was very different than just someone who attended a lecture once a week, okay? Or came to a worship service or even came to small groups. They would often give up everything, their jobs, their families. They would follow. Disciple is the same route for discipline. They were disciplined to follow their rabbi, their teacher. In fact, they wanted to be like their teacher. That was the end goal. They wanted to have the same answers, the same behavior as their teachers. And John had gathered these people around him, and he was telling people like it is. He was calling them to repent. He was baptizing them. He was letting the people know about the corruption that was going on with their leaders, and that'll come up again in a minute. But This was a serious commitment, and yet he watched people go and follow Jesus. Because that was the point. He was to make the way for Jesus. Now, sometimes we need that reminder that it's okay that people kind of move, or they they get reassigned. It's not always easy to see that happen. We want them to be with us. And even later, there would be jealousy. As Jesus was and his disciples were baptizing, John had to tell this to his disciples— He must increase, but I must decrease. What an amazing attitude of self-sacrificial behavior. Just to be honest, that is very hard for any of us to do, to say, Jesus must increase, I must decrease. But especially when you're in a role of somebody who's teaching and Jesus was there walking around and he's gaining disciples and he sees, John sees his ministry shrinking and shrinking. And for him to go, you know what, things are shrinking I'm not getting fame. Lots of people are resisting me. People are leaving and they're changing. And this is good. (laughs) It doesn't sound good, but it is what was supposed to happen. He was doing his mission. I'll tell you, John probably had disciples that fell away and they didn't go anywhere and that probably hurt him. Or they went to a false teacher and that probably hurt him. But when they were following Jesus, that was good. Even if they weren't side by side, because that was his goal. Now, at the time of Luke 7, things had changed for John. He had been thrown in jail. Let's refresh this with Luke 3. Luke 3, 18. So with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. But when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. So here John is. He's living his life as he's supposed to. He's giving everything that he's got. He's following the rules perfectly. And the Nazarite vow had a lot of rules. He's doing these things. And then he gets thrown in jail. One of the hardest lessons that we have to learn in living life is that society is not going to treat you better just because you're doing the right thing. It's where we get that phrase, no good deed goes unpunished. This world is in rebellion. It's very often that when you are following God, that you're going to receive resistance. And John the Baptist was dealing with some folks that just look like a Jerry Springer episode. I don't know if everybody gets that reference that's been off the air for a long time, thankfully, but it's still around in our culture. Herod Antipas, he was the tetrarch of the region. He had taken over for his father in this section, Herod the Great. Herod the Great, when he died, kind of his, his uh, territory was divided up. Well, Herod Antipas had a wife, but he decided he wanted somebody else. So he diver- divorced, his, divorced his first wife, Pharisalius. See, that's why I cited a minute ago. There are some hard words, so give me grace when I mispronounce these names. Uh, the daughter of King Artarius of Nabatea. And he did so for a married woman. So he was married. He kicked her to the curb and went after a married woman. But this married woman was married to his brother, Herod Archelaus. And you'll notice that they all get named Herod in some form or fashion. Um, And that's kind of confusing sometimes. But he went after uh, the wife of Herod Archelaus. And this is Herodias. Well, the problem with Herodias is that's also his half-sister. So he tried to steal his brother's wife, who was his half-sister. And and it's all just a mess. Um, It's not only immoral, but it actually caused a war. Because this, like many 
uh, marriages back then between royalty or leadership, it was arranged. And we have this idea, this radical individualism in the United States that we kind of think, you know, what we do in our house only matters to us. And to an extent, I want to protect that. That's my, my inclination because very much throughout history, it was too much the other way around. But actually, who you marry, who you interact with, who you're friends with, it actually does have a ripple effect across the whole community. And the more influence you have, the more ripple effect it's going to have. You see this arrangement with his first, or with his first wife, Phasalius, which I'm probably saying wrong, uh, caused a war with Nabatea. So Herod Antipas' desire for a married woman while he was married ended up in people literally dying for this kind of affair. Now, the sexual immorality of today on an individual level may not appear to have that many ripple effects. This is a pretty powerful guy, and that's why it rippled out. But when John called him out, he was doing so because it impacted people and because it was sinful, and Herod should have been setting an example And he was in a sense, but an example in the negative sense. Now, I don't know if John could have gotten away with that today. I think if John had called Herod out this way and called Herodias out this way, that he would have been told, you know, hush, you're not supposed to talk about politics. You're not supposed to get onto these people or name names specifically. And yet I look around and I see our culture and it is full of the same kind of sexual perversion and in fact worse than was going on then. And it it trickles into our leaders as well. We have it in the governor's mansion, we have that in the president's uh, house as well. We, are, we have issues of all kinds of politicians with multiple wives, multiple affairs. We have even accusations of inappropriate behavior from their own children against current government leaders. And so we have the same kind of issue today, and John is rightly calling it out because that immorality does have a ripple effect for everybody. But John was doing so in the spirit of love as well. Even though he was bold and stern, he would still desire. And I think this is where those who do call out immoral behavior sometimes fail. We forget that even when we call out that immoral behavior, we're calling for them to turn and come to Jesus. And we want them to receive grace, and we want to pray for them not just smack them down and and try to tear them down with the the meanest words that we can. No, they're made in the image of God too. And it's very hard to find that balance. And I know I certainly don't do it perfectly. But he's calling them out and he had done the right thing, but it got him landed in jail. But John had hope. He had a living hope as we were singing about. No doubt in John's mind, he was thinking about this passage in Isaiah 61.1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. So John thought, ah, my cousin over there, he's the Messiah. One of the things he's going to do is he is going to set the captives free. Well, here I am. I'm captive. What's taking so long? I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm trying to talk to my jailers with love, and yet here I am. John, no doubt, like some of the disciples, and we even saw this of the disciples that were walking on the road to Emmaus, they thought, oh, the Messiah, he's going to be the one to redeem Israel, to overthrow the shackles of Rome. John probably had some wrong ideas about what Jesus was going to do. There was a misunderstanding about the church age or this focus on Gentiles. They were really emphasizing the Jewish nation and the political side of it. Yet, of course, we see in the Old Testament there was more to it than that. But they didn't get the two comings idea, this first coming and the second coming. And all that is about grace so that more people could know him. Uh, But Jesus didn't seem to be doing what he thought, uh, what John probably thought he was supposed to be doing. So John wondered, was he getting this all wrong? Was he confused? And he couldn't go and get answers, so he sent others to get answers. Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord saying, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? So he's asking, have I been doing the right thing here and pointing everybody to you? Or have I been wasting my time? Why am I still here? This was his moment of struggle and doubt. When the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits. And he gave sight to many who were blind. And he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, 
The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Look at how Jesus responded to doubt. I think it's actually important to look at how Jesus did not respond to doubt. He didn't say, trust your heart. Jeremiah lets us know that our heart is of all things most deceitful and wicked. I really like to think of our heart as being dumb. There's a reason God gave us a heart and a mind. Okay, Sometimes we think with a heart and we, we connect with that with a seat of emotions. We often try to feel our way towards truth. Well, feelings by themselves are a really bad compass for finding truth and reality. We need thought too. We need thought a lot in figuring some things out. So he didn't say, uh, just follow your heart or just trust there. Or he didn't say, stay the course, right? There was some things that John was probably getting wrong in his understanding of the Messiah. And doubts are opportunities. When we come to doubts, if we look at what we do know, we might discover that part of the reason we're encountering a problem is because we have some incomplete information or because we need to make some adjustments. Based on what we do know, there might be some things we don't know and we can help Uh, where we could begin that process of figuring those things out. And he did not say, shame on you, you just need to have more faith, right? And we sometimes respond to people inside the church when they have real doubts like that. For years, about 70 to 80 percent of our college freshmen, when they hit the college campus, stop attending church. And every year it increases more and more. Now, many of them come back, but many of them never do. And when asked why they stopped attending church, Most of them will say, well, I had hard questions, and when I asked, they just told me to have faith, and nobody ever gave me an answer to the question, but this professor over here did. And since he's got the answers, I assume he knows what he's talking about, and my church was just doing its own thing, and they didn't know what they were talking about, which is so frustrating when we are called to worship God with our mind, and there are good answers. There's nothing new under the sun, so we can actually talk about these things. So he didn't say that, no. What did he do? He pointed him towards evidence, both the evidence of the miracles that he was doing, but also evidence of fulfilled prophecy. And this isn't some vague History Channel special kind of uh, prophecy on Nostradamus where everything is so vague that pretty much anybody could fulfill it. Jesus fulfilled over 300 very specific prophecies, and there's no way that chance would allow that to happen. This was intentional. There was a designer in the mix to make these things happen. The ones writing the prophecies had to know the future to get all of these things right. And it wasn't just one in isolation. It was all of them together. But what he was referencing there with Scripture also was Isaiah 35. And when John would have got this message back and when he had heard it, he wouldn't have He wouldn't have thought just in chunks of verses like we do. He would have thought of a whole passage. So to better get the idea that was communicated to John by the little snippet we read here, I'm going to back up a verse. We're going to read Isaiah 35, but we're going to start in verse 4 because when John heard about what was happening, prophecy being fulfilled right there, he would have thought of this. Isaiah 35, 4. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy, for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. He comforted him with scripture and with knowledge and evidence. And he said, hold on, John, hold on. Now, salvation would come for John but not in the way many of us would want it or he would expect it. John would go home. Unfortunately, Herodias, she was very upset with John the Baptist who continued to condemn her for the remarriage. It was so sinful. And so, and this is again, just a disgusting kind of thing. She took her daughter. So this is Herod Antipas's niece as well as stepdaughter and had her daughter do a sexy dance for Herod Antipas to get him to promise a favor. And when when they did that, what she asked for was John the Baptist's head on a silver platter. You can see the rage coming from them that they would want someone dead for simply saying something is a sin. We see that today. Not that we're treating anybody bad, not that we're throwing people in jail, but just calling something a sin often, you know, is responded to with this venom, right? We can hear it. Only God can judge us. It's my body. We don't want you forcing your religion on us. All these things just for calling something sin. We get heat, and here it happened. Now, this kind of 
John's calling them out for sinfulness, and this kind of weird thing with her daughter and Herod's stepdaughter and niece, it kind of proved John's point, didn't it? That was a messed up situation. But point proven or not, they executed John and he went home. The harsh reality is that sometimes God calls us to things in our life where we're going to, from an earthly perspective, fail, and we are going to have to deal with that in the meantime. God is still in charge. He's still in control. Salvation is still coming. It just may not come in the way that we want. Now, that's true for all of us as Christians. We're going to go home. We may not like how we get there, but God has a mission for us in the meantime. In fact, God is going to turn here. Jesus is going to turn, and he's going to talk to the broader audience here beyond John's message, John's messengers, and he's going to say this, Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Many in Jesus' day would have to adjust their expectations about Jesus. They thought Jesus was going to be a political ruler, kind of pull out a sword and take out Rome, and that was not what he did. He was setting the captives free. He was breaking every chain, but the chains he was concerned about was sin and falsehood, not the chains of Rome. Now, Rome would ultimately fall at the hands of Christians, changing one heart at a time. When suddenly the, the slavery that the Roman Empire was ba- based off of or profited from so much, when Christians were sitting side by side, well, I'm an owner and you're a slave, but yet we're having the same communion here and we're told to love one another as brothers. I don't think I can own you anymore. And so you had Christians setting people free. And you had a change and people actually learning, wait, these Christians, the men and women are faithful to each other? Then wives say, I'm only going to marry a Christian. Because <laughs> in that day, in the, the cultures that weren't Christians, all those different religions, the woman was expected to be faithful, not the man. And so you had all the social pressure. Wait, I want the, the marriage that Christians have. I want the family that Christians have. I want the love that Christians have. And you see this missional community reach out sharing truth and it changed Rome from the inside out one heart at a time that's what we have to do today and that's what we're called to do today but even today they had to adjust their expectations about who Jesus was so do we very often when we start out in faith we learn things and there is this temptation to go uh no I don't I don't want to follow that but as we read the Bible we'll confront that we've absorbed some false ideas from our culture We'll learn some things that we thought were okay to do aren't okay to do. We may even sometimes learn things that we thought weren't okay to do are okay to do, but we need to constantly be pursuing truth. Now, John, his messengers are sent away, and I don't think he got to hear this part. When the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. Pardon me. Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What's a reed shaking in the wind? We know it's a small little plant blown by every small little wind back and forth. John didn't bend on every whim. He was like Jeremiah 17, 8 states. He was like a tree planted by the water. And Peter warns us too as Christians not to be blown about by every wind of doctrine. Once he knew the truth, he was confident and he stayed in it. Now, you might think, well, he stayed in it. He just had this big moment of doubt that he had to send messengers and double check that Jesus was the Messiah. Well, Jesus didn't respond by saying, well, you're fired. You're no longer, you know, the herald or anything like that. No. Instead, John was still loyal and allegiant and faithful. He did the right thing with his doubts. He was open and honest about him, and he sought more information. He sought clarity instead of using his doubts as an excuse to dismiss something that is hard or that he might not want to do. Now, John is called the greatest born of woman, and that's kind of an unusual phrase. Well, Jesus is born of women. What's going on here? Well, Jesus has in mind, and we see that as we read the the rest of the words there around it in this passage, he has in mind that there is a coming change. He's going to be on the cross, and there's going to be a new, the church age ushered in, and there is going to be the bride of Christ. And now, John, he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He He died before Jesus was on the cross. He did not get to experience being in the church in the same way. He had his mission, 
but it was limited and focused. And Jesus is talking about, hey, John is wonderful. He is obviously greater than so many of us and great, all of us and greater than the people he was uh, talking to in terms of character and faithfulness, but he was not a part of something greater that is the church. This missional community that's supposed to go out and retake the whole earth, not just the Jewish nation, retake the whole earth by sharing truth in love everywhere and reclaiming it from the falsehood and the lies of the enemies, what Paul calls the powers and the principalities. And in that way, all those of us that are part of the church were a part of a greater work than John. Now, that should encourage us. John was great, but it should have encouraged them, see what's next. Join us as we take part in our mission that Jesus is saying is even greater than John's mission. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice. Tax collectors are called out because, well, we don't like the IRS today. They didn't like tax collectors then. Having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. So we get a called out group that supposedly, oh, you've betrayed us, you're working with the world. That's the tax collectors. And yet we have religious teachers here who have rejected this message. Some people don't like Jesus as he is. They want to recreate Jesus in some other fashion, but that is an idol. He doesn't have to actually be a statue to be a false god to worship. If you recreate Jesus as somebody besides who he really is, you've made yourself an idol. But Jesus is calling them to follow him. And we see here a wonderful example of how to deal with doubts. They're going to come up. They're gonna, we're all going to have them. We're all going to have questions. We're all going to have struggles. You are not the first one. And John decided to do something proactive about it. He went forward. And when he couldn't do it himself, he sent others to get the information. That's one of the reasons we live in community, because we're not the only ones that have experienced doubt. You as an individual, you're not the only one who's experienced wrestlings with something. And maybe somebody in a pew nearby has also wrestled with that exact same thing. We don't want people to just stay in that moment of doubt, but we we don't want to shame them that they happen either. Skeptics are welcome here. People with questions are welcome here. But we love them enough to try to connect them with the answers right? And that includes from the very beginning to all the way through our Christian journey as we encounter the weirdness and the obstacles in this world, things that will shake us a bit. We're here for one another. We can encourage one another. And together, and I pray we are really doing this, we can pursue a depth in truth that would allow us to continue our mission. I have found every time I have hit a real spot of doubt in my life, and I've fairly looked into it, I have walked away with a greater trust in Jesus and learning something from it. So next time you have a doubt, don't be scared. Don't be afraid. Don't shy away from information or anything like that. Dig in. Prayerfully dig in and lean on your older Christian brothers and sisters because maybe they've been through it too. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to dig into your word. I thank you for the example of John the Baptist and ask, knowing that we live in a world that throws all kinds of information at us and we live in a world where events happen that kind of shake us emotionally, I ask you that you would guard us in those moments of doubt, that you would protect us, that you would help us to respond to doubt as an opportunity and not something to increase our anxiety or fear, but that we would take our doubts, lay them at your feet, and that we would dig in. And I'm I'm so confident and I'm so thankful that every time I have done so, I have found you even more amazing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.